Welcome to uh, session 2A on data management. Uh, my name is Christopher Maronga, and I'm a, a, a co organizer uh, Nairobi R user group and also a long run uh, data manager uh, working with help research data management analysis. So today uh, we have four talks in this session uh, as you're going to uh, hear from the presenters. And the sponsor of the day is uh, Axlon and uh, the, se the session sponsor is uh, Sinker. So, so the first talk uh, uh, you're going to hear from um, Neil Richardson uh, on solving big data problems with Apache, uh, Apache Arrow. So Neil uh, leads an engineering team uh, at Ursula Computing and is also a package maintainer uh, uh, of several libraries uh, as well as the, the package for today's talk, which is the uh, Arrow. So he's previously had a PhD in political science and uh, has worked in um, uh, survey analytics. So uh, Neil Richardson, please uh, uh, welcome and get let's hear from you. Hi, I'm Neil Richardson. Uh, thanks for joining me today. I'm gonna to talk about solving big data problems with Apache Arrow and R. And to do so, I'm gonna share some success stories from Arrow users about how they have used Arrow to solve their problems. What are we talking about when we're talking about big data problems? Um, well, first of all, I just want to say that uh, the actual size of the data is not really something I'm gonna get into about whether your data is big enough to be considered big data. Size, of course, is relative. What was too big for me 10 years ago is not too big for my laptop today because it has a lot more memory. Uh, what I do want to talk about is when you're in that point where you're going from data that is big enough, to the, is small enough that you can work on it in your, on your computer on a single node to where it starts to push the limits of what you can do there. And these are this is what I call big data problems. So when I start getting data that's bigger than memory that I have, whatever amount that is, um, the normal tools that we use uh, in R to, uh, to work with uh, data frames, uh, they tend to not work as well. You, start, you, need to have to, you need to stretch a little bit there. When you have data that's bigger than you can work with on your machine, this generally comes with some other things, which is responsible for why the data is that size to begin with. Uh, it could be that the data is not local to your machine. It could belong, could reside on cloud storage somewhere like uh, Amazon S3 or a network file system, but it's somewhere that is on a system that's bigger than yours. Uh, because it's outside of your machine, it may also be data that you don't have exclusive ownership over. You may need to work with others that are either responsible for, for generating the data or who also need to work with this data. Uh, this Data, the data may also be getting large uh, and uncomfortably large for your machine because it is continually getting uh, updated. Uh, one example would be you know, a process that generates logs and you get a log file every day with transactions or events that happen. And this will cause it to grow and you have data that's split across multiple files. So what are some, how do we solve these problems? So one solution, uh, if, I have, if I just have data that is too big for my machine is to get a bigger machine. Uh, that could be expensive, may not be an option. Another idea is, well, it's too big for, for my computer, so maybe I need something like Apache Spark. I need some uh, big data uh, MapReduce type of job uh, in order to query this data because it's too big for my computer. Of course, if you uh, need to spin up a Spark instance, you, you know, maybe you're, you get into this world where you're actually becoming a sysadmin because you're managing a, a cluster of computers and managing permissions roles and YAML files and all of this stuff. And so uh, you've, maybe you've solved your big data problem, but you've also turned it into other problems. So what I'm gonna show you today are some examples where people have used Arrow to effectively shrink their big data problems to help you find small solutions to your big data problems, to make them no longer big data problems. They're just data problems, data problems that you uh, already know how to solve. Before I get into that, uh, I wanna talk a little bit about Arrow itself. Uh, Arrow, the Arrow project started uh, in 2016, over five years ago. We had our 1.0 release last year, which indicated the stability of the columnar format that is Arrow underneath it. Our latest release is 4.0. We've got a 5.0 release coming out later this month. We do releases every three months. And Arrow is fundamentally a, uh, a format for how data should be represented in memory, a columnar data format. And we have implementations in 12 different languages, R being one of them. 
And it really provides a shared foundation for data analysis. We're, it's drawing on lessons from databases and other data frame libraries uh, to try to take advantage of what we've learned there, as well as the advantage of the modern hardware that we have on our, on our machines. The Aero R package is on CRAN. It's also on Conda Forge. Um, you, we've got a package down site there. I've got the link there on the slides here. Um, we have nightly packages available that we build every night, binaries uh, for Mac and Windows. Um, these are available. None of the features I'm going to demonstrate or I'm going to discuss uh, from the case studies here require nightly features, but if you want to check out the latest things that we're, we're doing, you can download those. Instructions are all there on the website. So I asked on Twitter a while back for examples where people where Arrow had solved a real uh, data problem uh, to try to get a sense of what sorts of issues people were using Arrow to solve in, in the world. I know what I think of uh, as, a, as the maintainer of the package of what Arrow's capabilities are, but I was curious to see what people were doing with Arrow in practice. And a few common themes emerged, and I will walk through those next. Um, some of that was just the ability to write Parquet files. And I'll talk in a second about why Parquet is such a compelling uh, file format for data. Many people were taking advantage of Arrow's features for reading multi-file data sets and using dplyr to query them, where you can essentially select a subset of your data to pull into memory and do whatever analysis you want on it without having to read everything in first. Uh, another uh, case of this uh, was, was with being able to write the data into that partitioned format itself. And finally, there were cases of using Arrow's features for accessing cloud storage directly uh, as a way of uh, accessing that data and pulling it into memory. And a common theme of all of these was that Arrow was letting people work within their resource constraints, whatever those were, without needing to use bigger machines uh, or you know, a big data uh, solution like Spark and all of the complexity that comes with that. So it allowed us to solve our problems without uh, needing to go beyond what our current hardware uh, provided. So the first one I mentioned is Parquet. Parquet is a columnar file format, whereas Arrow is a memory format. Uh, Parquet uh, has a number of good features, uh, compressions and encodings that allow it to have very efficient small files, but that are also very fast to read and process. And it's widely used in big data systems. So even if you don't necessarily uh, um, write Parquet files yourself, you may encounter services that write Parquet files and you'll need to read them. And Arrow has simple functions for reading and writing Parquet. Uh, one interesting example, uh, Mike Thomas sent this to me. Uh, he had had a client that was building a shiny, he had to build a shiny app on top of some CSV data, but unfortunately the CSV data was so large that it would not fit on shinyapps.io to host it. And it was also not very performant. And just by reading the CSV and writing to Parquet and then using Arrow to read it, uh, we could get the file size small enough to, to host there and it was much more performant. What's more, uh, Mike put together a, a, a great example uh, Shiny app here uh, with the link there where you can check that out and play with it yourself. Very cool stuff. Second, uh, building on top of that, you know, when, uh, when data gets too big to read in memory, often we might want to split that into multiple files so that we can touch those separately. Uh, we can, beyond that, by splitting the files, by partitioning your data into multiple files, we can encode information about how it's split into the file segments, into the directory paths, uh, so that when we query them using Arrow, we can only touch the files that we need. We can use that directory information to uh, save even having to open the file to do any filtering. Uh, it is common for uh, big data generating systems to write data in partition forms, and with Arrow, we can read it, and we can also write data sets in order to partition them ourselves. So what does this look like? Just with a to very toy example, um, take the empty cars data set. Using arrow, we can say empty cars and group by to indicate we want to partition, group by cylinder, and then do arrow's write data set function to this directory. And then when I inspect what's in the directory, I see I've got subdirectories where, where cylinder equals four, cylinder equals six, cylinder equals eight. That's encoded in the file path. 
And so if I were to uh, read this, do open data set on this and then filter uh, where cylinder equals six, I don't have to touch those other two files. Obviously with empty cars, this is trivial. I don't need that savings, but with bigger data, it can really pay off and make your queries a lot faster. There are a number of cases that people uh, uh, discussed with me where this was a really big win for them. So one in the fraud detection, detection space, uh, with a data set reasonable size, millions of rows and hundreds of columns, um, they found it prudent to convert their data with Arrow from CSVs to Parquet and to partition it by month. Uh, Parquet was a good choice because they were working with a bunch of other teams, data engineering, uh, modeling, that uh, needed to access this data too. And Parquet is a good uh, efficient standard that people in the Python and Java and other ecosystems can, can work with. And because Arrow, the Arrow package, lets you treat this directory where I've split everything out by month, I can treat the whole thing as a single entity and query it. Uh, I don't have to, there's no extra overhead for me as a developer or as a, as a data scientist uh, in having the data in multiple files. I can treat it as one thing. Uh, so, you know, they would, after uh, repartitioning the data in that way, an example query that they did, you know, selecting a subset of columns from the data and uh, looking for places where there's missing data within each month. Uh, any sorts of uh, data cleaning and data processing tasks like this, we only have to read in the columns that we select into memory to do this processing. Another interesting, really interesting use case uh, from the government sector uh, in the British Columbian provincial government, they were trying to estimate the size of their homeless population. Uh, their data was stored uh, across lots of fixed width files from different sources and with different, corresponding to different time windows. And uh, aside from the complexity of that interface there, uh, they had struggled because uh, they needed, there was a big machine available to them and that was the only one that could open these files in order to, to do any analysis on it. And they had to compete uh, with other groups in order to get time on this machine. But using Arrow, by getting some time on the big machine and using Arrow, they could write these files to Parquet, so they'd be much smaller, and then partition them into standard chunks by year and month. And this had a number of benefits from them downstream. So they, uh, now they got all the data standardized. It's all, everything is in by you know, year and month. Uh, so you don't have to wonder uh, how a certain file is grouped. You've got this interface with Arrow's open data set function where you can just point to the whole directory and filter on it. And I'm filtering on year uh, in this example query. And so that means all of those files that are not in that year, uh, I don't even have to touch. And so I can pull in the subset that I care about and I can do that on the small machine. I don't need to get access to the big machine in order to do this. And this was able to unlock a lot of uh, work and analyses for them. Another use case of using uh, Arrow uh, to have multiple file uh, data sets that you treat as one uh, from, it comes from Chile from a group that was monitoring COVID statistics. And they used Arrow in a similar way to uh, be able to query using dplyr, these data sets that are backed by multiple files. There's a cool Shiny app here that you can check out. And they also have a paper published in Science looking at uh, the uh, uh, COVID incidents and mortality based on this data. Very cool stuff. The last example I want to talk about is reading data from the cloud. So. Uh, as I said up front, you know, one way you, uh, you commonly interact with data that is bigger is that it is stored like in an S3 bucket or on Google Cloud. And, um, and so it's, it's, it's there because it is bigger and uh, in order to let others work with it. Uh, Arrow has some nice features that let you work with S3 or uh, any file system that has an S3 interface and that's not necessarily on Amazon to read data sets and read single files. So if it's on S3, you can just use the S3 uh, URL, S3 colon slash slash, to point to your file in S3 and read and write. Um, additionally, using some of using the dplyr uh, multi-file data set backend, um, like we saw before, we only had to pull into memory the data that we were working with. We can also only download from S3, download from the cloud, that subset that we care about. And this allows us to uh, speed that up quite a bit. 
Uh, so uh, Jared Lander uh, wrote on this blog a while back about uh, analyzing the temperature data from a bunch of thermostats and sensors throughout his house. Uh, it's a very comprehensive blog post going from the beginning of collecting the data to you know, the visualization and inference on that. And uh, his data, his, the, he had a process where data from these sensors is pushed to DigitalOcean, which is another cloud uh, vendor, which has an S3-like file system interface to it. And so using Arrow, he was able to point at his DigitalOcean bucket and use dplyr on that to pull in just the columns he cared about and just the rows he cared about and uh, be able to explore this data uh, without having to download everything locally. So uh, Parquet files, multi-file data sets uh, for querying and accessing data in the cloud, all these are things that allow people to uh, really take advantage of the computing resources they already have at hand and avoid making big data problems out of their data problems. I wanted to thank everyone uh, who helped with this talk, particularly to those uh, who gave me the examples that we used here. Uh, really appreciate it. Arrow is uh, a growing, thriving community. We have over 600 contributors, many more people using and uh, reporting issues and feature requests. Uh, we can't do it without you. We really appreciate all of the, uh, all of the support that we have from the, uh, from the, the community here. Uh, our website, arrow.apache.org, uh, arrow uh, has lots of information there. And there's my Twitter handle, NP at NPR, if you want to ask me any questions. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Neil, uh, for the uh, uh, great presentation. Um, I think without uh, wasting much uh, time, we are going to move to the next presenter. Um, uh, the title of the talk is a framework for creating relational data with applications. So for the, pack uh, the package is respectable. So our presenter is Gabriel Becker. So Gabriel Becker is a certified computing researcher and a consultant uh, working in the biopharmaceutical space. Gabriel has, into, uh, has contributed to multiple new features in uh, collaboration with the R co development team. For instance, uh, Gabe collaborated with Luke Tierney on the implementation of Ultra framework, which was introduced in R version 3.5.0. Uh, so, Gabriel, uh, the floor is yours, please. Uh, go ahead and uh, present. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks, Christopher. Um, so, as you said, I'm uh, Gabriel Becker. Uh, I'm going to talk today about the Respectables package. Um, and this is a little bit of a different angle on this type of uh, data that we may be hearing more about uh, later in that we are going to be creating the data rather than accessing or using it. There we go. Uh, this, ta this, uh, this package is funded by uh, Roche and is copyright Roche and it's been released under the um, artistic 2.0 open source license. Uh, the source code and development version are available on the Roche public GitHub account uh, and a CRAN release will be forthcoming but has not occurred yet. So first off, what do we mean when we're talking about relational data? So I suspect many people have, have heard of it, but just a very brief uh, introduction. Uh, relational data is when you break a data set into multiple data so that a certain data is not repeated that doesn't need to be. So in this example, we have students taking classes and you can see that the names of the students only occur a single time um, in the, in, in the entire data set, in, in the entire database, in fact, whereas the students are taking multiple classes. And so by linking these student IDs across these different tables, we're able to do what's called normalization of the data, which is a much more efficient representation. And it's what happens in most uh, database, actual database systems that you will, uh, that you might hear about. That's not typically how data is represented in R, but um, Carol Miller's DM package does support this type of multiple table relational model in R, um, including both accessing um, database systems themselves and combining multiple data frames that live in memory that are owned by R into a single sort of virtual relational database. Uh, and this can declare these foreign key relationships, which is what that, uh, that is called that relationship between the student ID and the different tables. Um, and it can check what, whether the data meets those restraints uh, or not. Uh, because you can have invalid data when you have a constraint like this. So 
you may be asking if DM exists and DM does this already, then why, why are we here? What am I, what am I talking about? So the key here is that DM assumes that the data already exists and it gives you some really nice tools for filtering the data that understands these constraints and things like that, but it doesn't have any sort of tooling for creating the data under these types of constraints. And so that is what we're going to be talking about uh, for the remainder of this talk. So Respectables is what I'm going to call a recipe-based system for the simulation or creation of relational data. Um, so recipes, so data simulation, especially under these types of constraints may seem to be pretty complicated. And so the recipe may not seem like a great fit, but I hope that I can convince you that, that this is actually a pretty good model, uh, for, for what we want to do. So before we get into what an actual recipe for this type of data might look like, we're going to talk a little bit about the, the different types of interdependence that these types of data will have when we're when we're creating it rather than just accessing it. So the first is intra table. So within a single table, this has to do with things like the distribution of height depends on the gender of the observations that you're simulating, because different genders have different height distributions um, and things like that. Things where the actual variables in a single table are related to each other in some distributional way that your simulation um, or creation of the data is going to need to respect. Uh, the second type of relationship is inter-table or between-table relationships. These are these types of foreign key relationships that I was talking about previously, where an ID in one column actually specifies an observation in a different table where you can look up more information about that observation. In, in the example that we saw, these were students or, or classes. Um, in, the and in the example that we'll be doing for this talk, these will be um, customers that we're, that we're making up. Um, so speaking of customers, so this is, this is a toy example. This is not real data, but it has the types of constraints that and relationships that real data might have, but in a simplified enough way that I think that we that they can be illustratively useful in the small amount of time we have. So we're going to uh, simulate silly customers. Um, these they're going to have a few different things that we know about them. They'll have a unique ID. They'll have a stuff level, which is either low or high. They'll have a key size, um, which doesn't mean anything because the, all the whole data is made up, but it's normally distributed. But the mean of that depends on whether the stuff level was low or high or not. And then they will have dates for when their account was open and when their account was closed. Okay. So when we're talking about recipes, when you're going to make a recipe, the first thing that you need are ingredients. So the ingredients here are the ways that we can create these different pieces of the data set. So we've got uh, sample FCT, which basically just samples a factor, and that gives us our, our low or high for stuff level. We've got the key size function and all of these functions. So, so sample FTC, FCT is provided by the Respectables package. Key size is a function that I wrote for this, um, for this talk. And you can see, we're not going to go over exactly what it looks like, but the source is in the RMD that I used to make these slides, which is publicly available. So, so you can look at that if later if you choose. Uh, but that's going to give us these key sizes. And we can see that the um, we that takes a data frame that already has stuff level in it. And that's going to be really important. Um, and we can see here that you know the first two are low and the second two are high in stuff level. And we can see that you know the, the first two observations are lower than the second two observations. And then finally, we have this account dates function, which again, um, we're not going to go over the details, but it, the source is in the, um, in the RMD file. Um, and that spits out the account open date and the account close date, which is NA if it hasn't been closed, which happens to be the case for the first two of these here. Um, but if it has been closed, it has a date and the date is guaranteed to be after the open date, which obviously is important. Okay, so these are, these are our ingredients. And then this is what our recipe looks like. So our recipe is just a, a tibble uh, or a data frame with list columns, if you prefer. Um, 
and it has four, five uh, columns in it, uh, variables, hmm. dependencies, function, function arguments, and keep. So variable specifies what variables in the data set this row has instructions for. That can be a single variable or it can be multiple variables. And that's important. Dependencies is which variables need to have already been generated before this row can can be performed. Um, and no depths is just a, a sort of singleton that indicates that there aren't any. Uh, the function, which can be a string or a function object, um, is what function should be used to generate those variables. The R function args is additional arguments that should be that should be um, passed to it and keep is whether those variables should ultimately be in the final data set or not. And so once we have our recipe, uh, we just call gen table data, we tell it we want 500 observations and we give it the recipe and then it creates that it can tell which rows need to be performed before others because we gave it the dependency structure. And so we don't have to actually worry about that ourselves. We just put them in the recipe in any in any order that we want. And it takes care of that and out comes a data set that has the variables that I described. Okay. And it just so happens that all of the account closed are NA for the first six here, but there are non NA ones in there as well. Uh, so a brief aside, I'm not going to go too too much into this code exactly, but you can do this with dplyr so far. It's not it's not particularly hard, but there are benefits uh, to using this sort of recipe structure. It's easily reusable um, and it's automatically parameterized by the combination of func and func args. So if I want a different distribution for a particular variable, all I have to do is swap out a particular value in a data frame and call gen table data again and I have a completely new data set that is has, you know is Cauchy distributed instead of normally distributed or whatever you know whatever change you want to make. The other really important thing which is nice is that it supports jointly generating multiple variables. So we saw that the account open and account close dates were generated by a single function at the same time. Um, and this can be because there's some covariance structure that you want, or there's some sort of constraint where like we had here, you know, close can't be before open uh, and things like that. It's also really easy to add new rows to a data frame, which translates to adding new columns to the data that you're generating. Uh, so that's, that's nice. Still, though, that's pretty straightforward. Uh, the thing that gets a little bit more complicated where I think is Respectables is going to be a little bit more help to people, perhaps, is when we're simulating under these types of foreign key constraints, right? Um, and so what this is going to be a two-stage process. Um, and so first, we're going to translate the foreign table. This is the table where the foreign key comes from into what I'm calling a scaffold table. And the scaffold table just has the actual rows from the foreign table, but the dimension has been transformed by repping those out into whatever the new dimension should be. And so we can see that you can have um, you can have these foreign keys that appear multiple times. You can have foreign keys that don't appear. Um, and, but the, the point is we're not generating new values of anything. We're just transforming the dimension. And then once the dimension has been transformed, we just do the same process I just described to create all of the new variables in the new table. Right. And so by dividing it into this two-step process, each of the process, each of the steps actually ends up being quite simple. Um, and so the rest of the talk, we're going to talk about these sort of silly customers going shopping. Um, and just for, you know, to, for simplicity, because we don't have that much time, we're going to say that they are going, some of them will never go shopping. So we'll have some IDs that don't appear in the purchase uh, table. Some of them go many times um, and they all buy a single item whenever they go shopping, the item is random and it doesn't matter what they've purchased before, but it does depend on whether that item is actually being offered at the time. 
okay? Um, and so that means we have to know when the purchase, when the shopping trip was before we simulate what was purchased. So scaffolding is easy. So general uh, Respectables provides a couple of different scaffolding functions, the one or function factories, I should say. Um, and the one that we're going to use here is rand per key, which, as you might guess from the name, generates a random number of events or rows in the scaffold for each row in the foreign table for each ID. Um, and so we say that the ID column is the one that we care about. Uh, the minimum number of times that they could go shopping is zero. The maximum is five. Proportion of present is one. So that's just another way of specifying how many of them had any shopping trips at all. But since we're allowing the minimum count to be zero, we don't need to worry about that. And then we just, we, that gives us a function. Remember, this is a function factory. And so then we just call that with our silly data that we made before. Uh, and that gives us a scaffold table. And here we see this is how many of the customers are simulated to have each number of shopping trips from one to five. Uh, and there were 500 separate customers in the data that we simulated, if you call, and only 418 of them have, are, appear in the, in the scaffold at all. So we can see that it is the case that some of them didn't go shopping, like we said. Um, so then the scaffolding join recipe is going to look pretty similar to the recipe that we were talking about before. Again, it's just a, a table or a data frame with list columns. Um, in fact, I don't, most of some of them don't even need to be list columns, but you just specify the name of the table that the foreign key comes from, the name of the key. Uh, in that table, the function that actually is going to do the scaffolding, and then any additional arguments to that function. And that um, and that's it. And we'll use that in just a second. Um, and then, so this is just, uh, these are the products that we're going to let them buy. Um, this is mostly here just uh, for information. And then here's the ingredients of our new purchase um you know our new purchase table so we've got the buy date function uh which takes the the scaffold um and an end date and generates buy id and buy date and then the prods function which accepts something that comes out of the temp buys um and gives us product id and product description Okay, and the reason that that takes the thing that comes out of temp buys is because, as I said, not all of the products are always available. So we needed by date. We depend on by date, which is why that that's occurring there. Um, and then we've got our recipe, which looks the same as as last time. Uh, and then we're going to say gen rel join table, and then the name is possible. The names of these functions will change by the time it gets on CRAN, but that's what it's called right now. We specify what I'm calling the scaffolding join recipe. So the recipe for making the scaffold table, we specify the recipe for the new data. Um, and then we, we specify the database of things that have already been created. And you're not actually going to have to call this um, manually. I'll show you that at the end. But this is how we get this piece of it to work. And then there you go. We've got ID, which comes from the old. Uh, that's the customer ID. We've got by ID, by date, product ID, and description. Um, and we can see, in, in this case, this time, the uh, first ID went shopping a lot so all four of these are in the in the first um for the for the first customer okay so we've got a way to generate a single table that relies on on other tables with this foreign key mechanism we have a way of specifying tables that don't rely on foreign key so but we're talking about this sort of set of multiple tables so how do you do that well, when you combine recipes, you get a cookbook, right? Uh, and so uh, the cookbook is going to do the same thing that we've been doing this whole time, right? Which is, it's another table, and it's just what table you're making, 
what the scaffolding recipe is, what the data recipe is. And then the other thing that it accepts, which I didn't have time to get into, is uh, a recipe for missingness injection. So you can't actually inject missingness after the simulation step um, at random or systematically or whatever you want. Um, and that is uh, that supports that. And so then we just say gen data db and we give it the cookbook. Notice we're not passing it any, any of the data that we've previously created. So it's actually going to create these in order. Um, and then if we just look at the head of these, we can see that, you know, again, we've got these, these customers and then their buys. And that is it. So we've got a, a cookbook that combines these recipes um, that again, we can, we can customize all of these things. And that, that is respectables in just over 15 minutes. So uh, again, it will be on CRAN, it's not yet, but it is available on GitHub and is open source. Uh, and with that, if there are any quick questions, I think I can, I can take those before the next talk. So thank you for listening. Thank you so much, uh, Gabriel, for the uh, great presentation. Uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, we'll we'll keep we'll keep an eye on the questions from the uh, the audience, and we'll uh, have them at the end of the uh, the, the, the fourth presentation. So um, I'm going to quickly move to the next presenter, um, Peter Meisner. So Peter Meisner uh, is going to talk to us uh, about going big and fast uh, with Kafka. Kafkaske package. So Peter is a, a consultant at Virtual 7, a long term, uh, long time early user, and uh, is both a package and a book author. He's a data scientist, a web scrapping veteran, and uh, also part of Hamburg user meetup group. He's, uh, he's had uh, several years exp uh, of experience in analyzing and modeling data. And uh, these days, uh, Peter spends much time supporting both data science and IT projects as a technical expert in software development data pipelining and uh, general IT consult consulting. So Peter Misner, please, uh, uh, the floor is yours. Go ahead and present. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to my talk, um, Going Big and Fast, where I want to talk about uh, the Kafka S package um, to access Kafka. I'm Peter Meisner. I'm a consultant at Virtual7, a uh, software consultancy uh, based in Germany and uh, Romania. And uh, uh, personally, I tweet at Peter Loves Data. So let's get started. Kafka Ask is an R package to connect to um, a Kafka cluster to read from Kafka and to write data to Kafka. Kafka is an industry standard big data technology. Um, and uh, the package is available on, on GitHub at um, Peter Meissner slash Kafkaesque. And um, you can install it um, easily with the remote package using the install GitHub um, function. Why yet another package? Um, there are two packages um, which also provide um, Kafka access. Um, R Kafka and Franz. R Kafka is on CRAN, it's Java based, um, served as a blueprint for Kafkaesque. Um, unfortunately, it's not maintained uh, anymore and does not work with recent um, versions of Kafka. And there's um, Franz. Um, Franz is on, on GitHub, um, C++ based, but um, never got finished. So what is this Kafka? Why should I even care? Kafka is a message queue, so you can put in data and later on um, retrieve some data. So first data in, first data out. Um, Kafka is also locked, so meaning it's um, ordered, it's persistent, um, maybe it has a timestamp. Um, it's distributed over networks and servers. Um, it's fault tolerant, um, so your data is safe and the system will still work if parts of the system fail. Um, Kafka is scalable, so you can always add more servers and uh, get more uh, performance out of it. It's asynchronous, so um, you can you don't have to immediately consume data um, once it's put into a queue, but you can decide when to consume the data. And um, it's a big data technology, so you can think big. You can think in high throughput with uh, while having low latency at the same moment. 
and it's a infrastructure technology. So think more of it like a database than an R package. Kafka consists of um, various parts. So you, you have the Kafka cluster containing of multiple instances, usually of Kafka. Um, there the data is stored, data is stored in um, so-called topics, think like database tables for um, data messages, for data, for, for messages. Um, and those topics can be partitioned also um, maybe by timestamp, maybe by some round robin um, algorithm, or maybe by a, a key which you provide, right? So data from Germany goes in on one partition, data from France goes in another partition and things like that. Then you have producers which can connect to Kafka and um, put in data and you have consumers which can also connect to Kafka and can consume data and both are just pieces of software. Okay, but why should I care as a data scientist, right? Kafka is open and language agnostic um, by nature. So it makes it ideal to um, share data um, with um, other parts of the system, with other users, with other languages, um, between software components or, or parts of a, of a software or IT system. So you can access, for example, um, data already ingested in Kafka, or you can make it easy for producers of data to share data with you and the other way around. You can have an easy time sharing data with other parts of the system, right? Um, Kafka is low latency, high throughput, which allows to um, use it for any kind of stream processing, think real time or near time analytics uh, processing and, and, and data analytics applications. Um, it's distributed by nature, so you can spread data. You can also use it to, to spread tasks among our workers, for example. Especially you can uh, decouple time and location of data production and time and location of data consumption. It does not have to be the same server. It does not have to be right now, right? Um, Kafka is fault tolerant and, and comes with some data persistence guarantees, um, making it a, a nice tool for debugging, for also exploring data after the fact and replaying data if needed and um, for auditing purposes. So if you have to prove that things in your system have happened <clears throat> or you have to have a way to um, see what happened when and where um, Kafka might be a good choice. Since Kafka is so great, uh, good thing that there's a package for that. Um, Kafka Ask um, binds to Kafka's native um, Java libraries. Kafka is written in Java and uh, Scala. Um, Kafka Ask uses R Java um, for R Java communication and itself only depends on JSON light data table in macrid R and R6 and has also light dependency in the Java libraries realm. Now let's have a live demo of the package. The first thing we have to do is actually spin up uh, a Kafka cluster. Um, I prepared the Docker container for this, um, starting Zookeeper and um, Kafka uh, and adding some some messages um, into the system. So, next we can go into R, we uh, load the library, we create the consumer object, um, spin it up, um, let it connect to Kafka, um, we retrieve uh, a topic list, um, we subscribe to a specific topic, and then we start consuming messages one by one, seeing 
that a message actually consists of a topic and a key and a partition number, a specific offset, a timestamp when the message was created. And uh, here we see uh, the message value. Instead of consuming messages one by one, we can also um, use another pattern. We um, start a consumer, spin it up, subscribe to um, a topic. And then we use the consumers consume loop um, method to loop and constantly consume messages one by one. So this will take some time. So we want to consume 10,000 messages. Um, it's done now. Um, we consumed the messages. We also did some aggregations and we see that consuming 10,000 messages, messages um, took us around about 11 seconds. In the last example, we consumed the and processed the messages one by one but we don't have to do it that way. So Kafka provides a way to consume uh, messages in batches. And I prepared an example and let's see how fast this is consuming the same amount of messages. And it only took 0 0.69 seconds to consume 10,000 messages. Producing messages is easy as well. Um, we load the library, we create a producer object, um, start it up and immediately can send messages to Kafka to specific topics. Last but not least, let's have an um, example um, showing real-time interaction between consumer and uh, producer. Um, for this, I prepared um, um, a consumer application um, just printing out message values and the producer application um, putting messages into the user use our 2021 um, topic. Now I switch to the command line, I um, spin up my demo consumer application and I spin up um, my producer. Um, we see the consumer already has consumed some, some messages and now the producer will produce messages as well and the consumer should pick it up. And this is what we are actually seeing. So a constant stream of messages is consumed uh, or is produced by the producer and the constant stream of messages is consumed um, by the consumer. So we, if we stop, stop the producer, then the consumer should also um, stop printing out messages. And we, if we start it again, then this should um, start to work again. So this was a quick live demo showing what the package can do, uh, how it works, how you can use it um, for your analytics um, pipelines. And um, there's more to it. Um, you can tweak um, how Kafka behaves or you can add partitions to um, topics to uh, make use of user groups, um, of consumer groups and so on, but uh, for a live demo. I think this should be all for now. Having talked about Kafka, having um, talked about the package and having, uh, having had a live demo, it's time to look back. Um, so a lot of the work um, on the package was um, um, connecting R with Java, which was actually uh, better than um, our Java's reputation. Um, so it's doable, it's a little bit low code, um, everything is typed and you're kind of restricted to, to method calls and scalars and vectors, but it's basically, it is okay. I advise to, um, if you'd want to do it, something like that on your own, to do uh, to use a project as Blueprint. Um, 
I did it. Um, you can use Kafka Ask as a as a blueprint, and I'd suggest um, using VS Code for for Java development. Um, this was quite easy. Um, concerning um, putting um, the the package on CRAN, it's not done if it's not on CRAN. Um, this was kind of a of a bummer. Um, I, I tried to put it on CRAN, but uh, basically the um, package and the Java dependencies sum up to something like 11 megabytes, and um, CRAN has some strict uh, package size restrictions. Um, um, yeah, so um, the only way for me is. Um, to develop my own downloading, um, Java dependency downloading um, routines or functions, which I'm a little bit hesitant because I think there, there should be a common way to do it. So maybe in the future we can have something like that or can, can work as a community on, on um, something like that. So this would make life much easier. Um, to conclude, Kafka is a solid technology um, with use cases also on data science, data analytics, um, and uh, also Kafka S might be a little bit limited to text data at the moment. Um, it can be extended and it's um, at the moment the, the only working R binding for Kafka, allowing the R community um, to control all major Kafka API endpoints, um, um, allowing the R community to have access to this um, industry standard um, big data technology. Um, thanks everyone. Um, that's uh, all from me. Um, see you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you so much, Peter, for the nice presentation. I think uh, we like have a couple of minutes. Uh, maybe you could take a question or two, but I think we could just quickly move to the last presentation so that we can have time for more questions okay so uh great so uh, our last presentation uh, is titled uh, uh, scaling r for enterprise and uh, our presenter is uh, mark honick so mark is a senior director of product management uh, for oracle machine learning and he has uh, has five has over 20 years experience in integrating and leveraging machine learning with oracle technologies working with both internal and external customers so uh, actually, Mark Honig is the Oracle representative on the R Consortium Board of Directors. And uh, Mark, please uh, take the floor and present. Hello, and welcome to this session on scaling R for enterprise data. My name is Mark Hornick, Senior Director of Oracle Machine Learning Product Management. R is a powerful analytical tool that's made significant performance gains with each new release. However, with ever increasing data volumes, it can be the data itself that poses some of the biggest challenges. What can we do to avoid or minimize moving data, yet still get the benefits of R? As we discuss in this session, Oracle Machine Learning for R enables you to work with database tables and views using familiar R syntax and functions, among other capabilities. Let's first take a look at some common enterprise machine learning pain points. Common themes include data access latency, taking too long to get or load data, Sometimes data access requires making explicit requests to DBAs for data extracts, and it may take a few iterations to get the needed data. Users may have programmatic access to data sources, but this still requires pulling data to separate analytical engines. Next is a lack of scalability and performance. Does all the data fit into memory? Can the algorithms take advantage of multiple CPUs? Another issue is complexity and the time it takes to put models into production. You've likely heard the statistic that 87% of data science projects fail to make it to production, or that only 20% of such projects will deliver business outcomes. Deployment complexity contributes to these statistics. In other cases, there are concerns about data security, backup, and recovery. How are copies of data managed and secured? In deployed solutions, how well is backup and recovery addressed and tested? Let's look at a few specific scenarios. When it comes to enterprise data, data scientists commonly deal with multi-gigabyte data sets, likely several of them. Just loading data into our memory can take a surprising amount of time. 
For example, using Read CSV on a gaming PC with 16 gig of RAM to load a 4 gigabyte CSV file of six columns and 100 million rows as a baseline took eight minutes. So doing that too frequently could affect your productivity. Assuming linear scaling, a 16 gig file would be expected to take over half an hour and a 32 gig file could take over an hour. Now, we can also use the data table package with read table to do significantly better, but this is still not ideal. And we still have a 3.6 gig R data frame in memory. More advanced packages like Vroom don't load the entire file, but instead index where each record is located and data is read when you use it. But this has some drawbacks as well. Jim Hester has some excellent videos analyzing the performance benefits of Vroom. You should check them out. The sampling dilemma we're faced with is, to fit in memory, data needs to be sampled. But to be sampled, data needs to fit in memory. Ideally, you'd be able to determine your sample at the source and pull exactly the subset of data you're interested in. Newer capabilities, like those found in the Vroom package, have many benefits in this space, but not necessarily for database data. Now, deploying a solution often involves a job scheduling environment and then starting the R engine. We then load the R script and likely need to load source data for model building or data scoring, and possibly writing or reading models or other objects to and from our data. We might store results back to the data source, perhaps programmatically. And finally, we stop the R engine until the next time this needs to be run. So while deployment complexity may vary, there are at least a few potential failure conditions that need to be accounted for. So we overcome these and other challenges for users by leveraging Oracle Database as a high-performance compute engine. OML for R provides immediate access to database tables and views using R data frame proxy objects. These proxy objects overload familiar R functions that produce SQL transparently behind the scenes for scalable and high performance in database processing without moving data to a separate server. In database parallelized and distributed machine learning algorithms further eliminate data movement and take advantage of multi node and multi processor hardware. R users can create and store user defined R functions as well as R objects like ML models in the database avoiding the need to manage and keep track of separate flat files with deployed solutions. For enterprise application and dashboard developers, accessing database data and results via SQL is pretty much routine, so the ability to invoke user-defined R functions from SQL can speed production deployment in the final stretches of an R-based project. Using proxy objects in the transparency layer, users operate on database data with familiar R syntax and overloaded functions by using query optimization, column indexes, data parallelism, and even storage level partitioning that benefits SQL query performance, data exploration and preparation from R gain similar benefits. In database algorithms are exposed through familiar and seamless R interfaces that operate on proxy objects and use the R formula specification. The resulting models reside in the database as well with their own proxy objects, both for prediction and inspecting model details. Through embedded R execution, user-defined R functions can be invoked on database environments spawned and controlled R engines. There's no need for configuring parallel environments or frameworks. Embedded R execution simplifies data parallel and task parallel processing. So how do we do this? OML for R introduces proxy objects that behave as R data frames, but map to database tables and views. Here we show how the proxy ORE frame is a subclass of R's data frame class. While the R data frame contains the actual data, the proxy object contains metadata, including a reference or query to the data table or view. Regarding benefits of OML for R algorithms, consider this example. We built an R linear model using LM on a 100 million row database table with seven variables to predict arrival delay from on-time flight data. Our VM has 32 cores and 2.8 terabytes of RAM. This required loading 7.6 gigabytes of data, which took about 21 minutes. 
Building the LM model, single-threaded, took 38 minutes. Total time to get the first model was 58 minutes. Using models that operate where the data exists in the database with OML for R, even when run single-threaded, we see a 1.6x performance improvement simply because we didn't need to move the data to a separate analytical engine. But as we increase the number of threads to 64, parallelism brings the initial hour down to 1.3 minutes for a 42 times uh, performance improvement. Many factors affect machine learning performance, not just data volume, but also algorithm choice, number of concurrent users and load on the system, as well as available hardware. As we see here, the combination of in-database parallel computation and no data movement has significant benefits. This plot shows essentially linear scalability across multiple in-database classification algorithms, with data ranging from 100 million to 800 million rows. At the high end, we build a naive Bayes model on 800 million rows in just over two minutes and an SVM model in under 16. These results were run on Oracle Autonomous Database in the Oracle Cloud using OML for SQL, our SQL interface to the in-database algorithms. But OML for R exposes these same in-database algorithms from the R interface for on-premises and database cloud service databases. In this example, we illustrate how embedded R execution provides data parallel functionality to build multiple models where data is partitioned by values from a particular column or set of columns. Perhaps we want to build one model per customer, even using third-party packages. With the data accessible as a database table or view, we write an R script that builds a model for an individual customer or zip code. This is then wrapped as a user-defined function that is stored in the R script repository. Using the group apply functionality results in spawning the requested number of R engines in parallel, loading the user-defined function, and automatically passing one partition of data to each R engine to build models until all the data is processed. The resulting models, instead of being stored in multiple R data files, can be stored in the database, in the R data store. Here's the corresponding R function invocation that realizes this scenario. Using the function ORE group apply, we pass in our customer data proxy object and that we want to partition on customer ID. Then we pass in the user defined R function that takes two arguments, the data that will be automatically passed in as an R data frame and the name of the data store where we want to have the resulting model stored. We build an LM model, which could also leverage one or more third-party packages and use ORE save to store the model in the data store. To complete the group apply function arguments, we pass in the string for the data store name, indicate we'll be connecting back to the database, and that we want uh, to run this in parallel. So let's switch to a quick demo of OML for R. In this demo, we're going to use the RStudio IDE, although many IDEs are in compatible with uh, Oracle Machine Learning for R. In the transparency layer, we're first going to load the ORE library. ORE stands for Oracle R Enterprise, the previous name of this component. Next, we'll connect to the database. In order to get the proxy objects we want, we'll use ORE.sync, the two tables that we'd like to use in this demo, and we'll attach the environment to the R search path. Next, we can see the tables that are available in this environment. In this case, narrow is an ORE frame, a proxy object, and we can use overloaded functions to see which columns are present as well as the dimensions. We can compute summary statistics on this ORE frame, which does all the computation in the database. So whether we have 1,500 rows or 15 million rows, there's no data movement except for the final results. Now we can also pull data from the database into uh, the R environment, and we see that we get back an R data frame. Here we're going to extract the year destination arrival delay columns, and we see that the class of that is also an ORE frame proxy object, and the dimensions and the uh, first few rows are viewed. Now, loading the ORE dplyr library allows us to use overloaded dplyr functions, whether to select columns or filter rows. For joining data, 
Let's create a couple of data frames and merge those using our standard merged uh, function. Next, we can uh, drop tables from our database, and then we'll create two tables based on the data frames we just created, DF1 and DF2. These can use the overloaded merge function to do the join in the database itself. Of course, we can use the overloaded uh, dplyr function to uh, do this join as well. For machine learning, let's build an OERI LM model to predict arrival delay based on distance and departure delay for our proxy object on time s. And then we can get the summary results as well. And we see that this is exactly what we would expect from the R LM function, but this is able to take advantage of parallelism. Next, let's use the Titanic dataset to use uh, the in-database naive Bayes algorithm. We'll first create a temporary table uh, in the database of the Titanic dataset, and we'll do some recoding and create a factor for survived, taking 0 and 1 to uh, no and yes. We can summarize this data as well in the database, and then we'll sample our train and test sets. We're using row indexing to allow us to get the exact rows that we want for our sample. We can specify priors for the naive Bayes algorithm, and then we'll build that model to predict survived based on a number of other uh, variables. We'll predict on our test set, and again, the results from prediction in the database are also an ORE frame, a proxy object, because these results themselves can be very large and we'll get a, the first few rows uh, from the result. With the results still in the database, we're going to use the overloaded table function to compute a uh, confusion matrix for our result. So let's move on to embedded R execution. Now, in the case of uh, group apply, let's say that we wanted to build one linear model per destination to predict arrival delay. Here we'll do our data preparation, we see that we have 51,000 plus rows and 25 columns, and then we're going to invoke OERI group apply, partitioning the data on destination. And you see our function is very simple to build a linear model uh, to predict arrival delay based on distance and departure delay. We can see the summary of the uh, Boston Logan Airport results. Now switching to the SQL developer environment, we can not only create this uh, function in the R interface, but we can also do the same thing in SQL. And then we will run uh, our function that will create random red dots two in the database. We can then invoke a SQL query to return the uh, ID and the image of our function invocation. Looking at the results, we see that we have our images available uh, returned from the database. Now, let's say we wanted the structured content. We can return the ID and value that we had created as the return value of our uh, data frame from our function uh, by specifying the table definition. In this case, uh, select one ID and one val from dual. And you see that we get back a table that could be used to join with other uh, tables and views as well. For more information on Oracle Machine Learning, go to oracle.com slash machine dash learning. Thanks for learning more about Oracle Machine Learning for R. Fantastic presentation. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Maconic, for the uh, great presentation. So uh, I've, I've seen quite a, an interesting uh, uh, discussion on the Slack, and uh, I'm encouraging uh, everyone to uh, like head there and uh, engage with the speakers. So uh, we've saved a couple of minutes. Um, just going to uh, pick on a, uh, a few questions that have just come up so that we could wrap up the session. Okay, so um, so there are three questions for Neil Richardson. Um, so the first question is from Eva Castillo. I hope I uh, pronounced that name correctly. So, uh, so, uh, so can, can it be used to work directly with Athena queries in uh, AWS? I think this is Amazon Web Services, the package. Neil? Yeah, thanks for that. Um, uh, that's a good question. Uh, I think, if I'm not mistaken, um, Athena, uh, AWS Athena can emit data in the Arrow format. Um, so you could write a wrapper that would query Athena. Uh, I think I'm just Googling this after you asked, and I think there are 
uh, one or two rappers out there using uh, JDBC to connect to Athena. So you could, you probably could uh, speed that up a little bit by uh, by using getting Arrow in the mix there. But uh, out of the box, no, it does not. It does not do that. Okay. So thank you. The second question is, uh, what's the benefit of using uh, Parquet over Fender format? I think this is a data table thing, or yeah. Sure. So the um, so Parquet is uh, is is a on disk file format, whereas Feather, which is the the name for the Arrow uh, file format, is literally just the Arrow memory written to disk. So there's some trade-offs there. And I linked, uh, there's on the Arrow website, uh, there's an FAQ that goes into this a little bit. And uh, at ursalabs.org on our blog, um, last year we, we did an exploration of uh, Feather versus Parquet and what some, and we a discussion of what some of the trade-offs are. Um, basically, Parquet is gonna be smaller on disk. There's some features that it has that allows it to compress and encode data efficiently. Um, and there's also some column statistics and other things that are in the format that we can take advantage of when we're uh, doing a, a scan across a big data set and let us skip over big chunks of, of data if they don't match any of the, if our filter doesn't match any of those rows. Uh, so those are some nice features on the Parquet side. On the Feather side, um, you know, there's no processing required to start working on it. Uh, you don't have to decode or decompress or anything. Uh, so, um, so there's, depending on your disk speed, uh, that might actually be, uh, more advantageous. So there's, there's some trade-offs there, but, uh, check out the Aero website and, uh, our, there's a labs blog if you want to learn more. Okay. So actually that's a question, that's, that's a question from Daniel. So, uh, the last question is uh, from Peter Mesner. So, uh, Peter is asking, uh, whether we can do in-memory data sharing yet. Um, so you're talking about with Arrow doing in-memory sharing. Um, so, uh, you can, uh, essentially share memory between when within process, uh, between, for example, between Python and R, uh, if you want, if you are using a, uh, reticulate in R to use some Python project and it is yielding Arrow data, you can essentially take that into R uh, and you're sharing that memory. You're taking it uh, without moving it or copying it or anything. Uh, that's in process. But if you're talking about sharing across processes, uh, there's this uh, service called uh, Plasma that's a part of the Apache Arrow project. It's a Python, primarily Python uh, project. Um, it's not super actively maintained these days, but it's a, it's a shared memory object store. And so you can use that to share across processes. Okay. Thank you. Thank related, you. Uh, related to that, um, has there been work on um, backing an, an alt rep vector by Arrow? Like I talked to um, Wes about that like a few years ago at this point, um, and there were there were some sort of gotchas in the in the fact that you're using masks and stuff, but they seemed solvable. Uh, has there been has there been work towards that? Yeah, there's been a little bit uh, recently, and I think in uh, the next era release coming out uh, later this month, there'll be the first pieces of that of of alt rep uh, from Arrow to R, um, and yeah, it, it definitely seems tractable. Uh, and as I learn more about it, and uh, Roman Francois has been working on on the, the, those integrations too, um, we're we're starting to bring some of that in there. Um, so I, I think, I think we can make it work, uh, even, cool. with, even, even without the issue about the Sentinel versus, uh, bit mask. Yeah. Um, so maybe it's, there's, maybe there's some things we can do to finesse that too, but yeah, it's coming cool. and it's, uh, it looks pretty, it looks pretty nice when it works. <laughs> nice. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Gabriel for the contribution. So, uh, um, I have a couple, uh, about three questions for Peter Mason. So, uh, so Peter, the first question comes from Matt Barnett. I hope that's the correct pronunciation. So, uh, so Peter, what do you use it uh, for in practice, and what are your applications for Kafka? Um, 
Yeah, I, 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 I had some some use cases in in the in the talk. So basically, accessing Kafka data, which is already in Kafka, um, I think is a, is a major use case. So basically, why we got into um, using it in the in the first place um, was something else. It was about um, having a way to distribute work among um, servers. So we wanted to spread out. Um, work packages to to some simple R scripts, uh, which were doing some jobs. And we did not want to um, be imperative. So we don't want to, to push the work to the workers, but we wanted to just spin up some workers or scale them down. And if they are ready, they, they, they pull in some, some new work, right? And um, and, and for this, um, um, Kafka was 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 um, very nice because it has a lot of nice properties. You can have consumer groups, so, so uh, a lot of workers can can share the same offset, reading the the, the messages. Um, so they they coordinate uh, in a way, and um, also you can replay data. So if you made some mistake, especially. Um, doing kind of development, you can say, okay, um, we messed up, but please go go back and, and just do it again. And so this was our our use case um, to to basically build a massively parallel uh, web scraping framework um, with with our processes. Um, yeah, um, I hope this this kind of answers the the question. Thank you. So, uh, Gabriel Becker also was wondering if you um, combined Kafkaski with the future package. Whether yeah. You into, whether you looked into combining the Kafkaski package with the future package. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, in, 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 um, uh, in, in, in my mind, um, like uh, future, future package is, is super cool, but in, in my mind, it was. Um, like when you use future, you kind of push work or, or data around, um, right? So um, it's it's not independent in a way. Um, and so for me, always those two concepts were kind of separate. Uh, but then um, there there was some some comment also by by Gabriel um, um, that both things are kind of asynchronous. So there might be something very interesting there to um, kind of make um, you know Kafka regress in, in the background um, being non-blocking or something like that. But uh, this is something I haven't thought about, but um, uh, might be promising. So it's, it's it's worth thinking about for the for the future. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Peter. Uh, so, uh, in the interest of time, I will just I want to ask uh, a question uh, to Mark Honig. I think this is a question from Gabriel Becker still. So, uh, Mark, uh, so what happens when you subset a proxy object? Or, or a new proxy object or uninstalled and then subset? Uh, that's a question I I, had, I I hope I hope it reads well. So, what happens when you set when you subset a proxy object? Ah, new proxy subset. object. Sure. When yeah. you subset a proxy object, essentially you're getting another uh, proxy object from that. So the whatever the corresponding SQL that would be produced by your operation that you did in R, you're essentially creating a view, and the new proxy object refers to that view. So you'll end up getting stacked SQL if you invoke multiple uh, operations in uh, sequence. Okay. Thank you. I think our time's up. Uh, I just wanted to remind you that uh, the sponsor of the day was Apisilon and uh, the session sponsor was Sinkra. And I thank, thank everyone for uh, uh, getting time to attend. Also, with, uh, thanking the presenters for taking time to put the pieces together to present. So, um, Gwen, take it back to you.